will we do with the drunken sailor? What will we do with the drunken sailor? What will we do with the drunken sailor early in the morning? Way hey, and up she rises, way hey, and up she rises, way hey, and up she rises early in the morning. Shave his belly with a rusty razor, shave his belly with a rusty razor, shave his belly with a rusty razor early in the morning. Way hey, and up she rises, way hey, and up she rises, way hey. Bull has a fantastic history, and, and, and it's really interesting. And as far as we in the Rotary Club are concerned, we would like to retell some of those stories in a way that people can appreciate today. So that's why we're making a video of this story. That's why we're writing a heritage booklet. That's why we've tried to involve the schools in our activity, because we think it's a, a fascinating period, and that young people in Bull today really should appreciate more of what was going on in those days. It's a very important part of their culture and their How history. Are you? Uh, Excellent. Well, that really said, should be your height. It was eight. So one of the key things for the club about this um, project was interpreting the history of Poole for local people, explaining to them. Because many people live here and we don't know about where we live. And so it's really important and what we try to do is, is simplify it, make it really easy for people to understand how Poole has developed in this 150 year period. This is the seal of Poole. All right. The little boat with two masts dates from the 1300s. That one? Oh, wow, well, it's, it's the old antelope, which is just up the high street yeah. on the left hand side. It's the old coaching inn, isn't it? Yeah, the old yes, antelope. Yes, yes. Yeah, antelope. Yeah, yeah. It's a new build, but down on the bottom, at about um, that level, uh, right. you've got tiles. And that one? But, uh, well, it's one of the alleyways yeah, that run. Yeah, 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 one of the alleyways that run through. Um, I don't reckon this one fools a lot of people. Yeah, I don't reckon. You've not been in your museum. Room. It's an exhibit on the ground floor. You have to go up to the first floor to see that carving. Right. It's the top of an 8.3 metre Dutch rudder. Well, I'm I showed it this morning. It's more gold that we were at the boat show and we took part yesterday with the Harry Pay Day um, is that specifically wants us to share the heritage that we find out about in the project. So that period of Paul's history from Elizabethan times through to Georgian times is the period and whatever we find out through the research that we've done over the last six months or so we're going to share with people over the next few weeks um, before the project ends in uh, September. Part of the um, end of the project is to celebrate or to have some celebratory events when we can tell people what we've been doing, what we've discovered and uh, moreover make it a bit of fun. <laughs> If you want to go historically correct, yeah. people would become pirates because the Navy was absolutely rubbish to work for. So True. basically what they used to do is they had a choice, they could either stay in the Navy or they could mutiny and become privateers or pirates. In the 17th century, three of the alleys on the quay were known as Buttons Lane, Bennett's Alley and Rogers Lane. And people asked us, where they got their names and we didn't know the answer. So we did some research and we found three seamen from those times who may have lent their names to them. Um, they had fantastic, exciting lives and through the lens of their lives, we explored Poole's maritime history over the period of their lives, 1580 to 1730. It's very much the period leading up to Poole's heyday in Georgian times. Bennett worked for the Royal Navy, as his father had. Um, he worked for the Royal Navy out of Poole. He commanded vessels of different sizes, increasing sizes, 
and he was he was working in convoy work, hard convoy work. It was described as, but it was a very periodic role that he had with the Royal Navy then. Um, he would have one year on and one year off, as it were. And nobody really knows what he did in the other years. But when he died, he left the will equivalent to about four and a half million pounds worth in today's money. Um, he certainly didn't make that from the Royal Naval experience. And in 1681, some of his family members or his extended family in Poole had been named in a um, a report on smuggling in Dorset and it's thought that probably he had some influence um, of that sort in the years when he wasn't working with the Royal Navy. The other one I wanted to mention was Button of Button's Lane maybe. Um, Admiral Sir Thomas Button for most of his career was working for the Admiralty with two ships off of the southern Irish coast and the southwest coast of England specifically trying to control the piracy. He um, didn't get a pension for his wife at the end of his life because the Admiralty felt that he connived too much with some of those pirates. My father taught me of the sacking of Malaga by the English fleet. We have also an actor playing the part of Woods Rogers, one of the three characters and a fantastic character that we've um, discovered in the project. And he was a pool boy at the age of nine, he lived in Thames Street in 1688, and he subsequently went on to circumnavigate the globe. He discovered Alexander Selkirk on a desert island off Chile. Uh, Alexander Selkirk became Robinson Crusoe in Daniel Defoe's book uh, when he heard about the story. Um, he also robbed a Spanish galleon in the Pacific and brought back a lot of money from that, came back a national hero and subsequently he went off to the Bahamas where he was governor. And there Woods Rogers uh, was a party to dealing with piracy in the Caribbean, stopping piracy in the Caribbean. And indeed the Bahamas uh, recognized what he did and achieved for them right up until um, 1973 with their motto, piracy expelled, commerce restored. Three hours for this uh, 150 years. It wasn't long enough. I've been given 15 minutes today to cover 150 years, so this will be a whistle stop uh, tour. Anyway, let's go back to the start. In every age, there have been pioneers. He's an interesting character because his real name was Giovanni Capotti. He, he was a Viennese, a Genoese actually, a uh, navigator, and as we've heard, uh, discovered the uh, Newfoundland in 1497. And he's the real trailblazer for our story. A significant step came in 1583 when Sir Humphrey Gilbert landed in Newfoundland and claimed it in the name of Elizabeth I. Twenty ships a year were going from Poole to uh, Newfoundland. The Glorious Revolution, which Bernard mentioned, was welcomed in Poole. The Treaty of Utrecht recognised Newfoundland as British territories, and this began the great period of prosperity. So the fish were the fishermen went out in small boats which were often called shallops. They didn't sail, go fishing in the large boats that they'd taken over. They would anchor those offshore and use small boats. Now, whether the boats from the year before were still there or not, you know, that was a matter of touch and go. Piracy, fog, <coughs> storms, perhaps we haven't mentioned disease as much. Colds and flu were major issues of law and order. Keeping order among the sailors was, was quite a, an issue. And they weren't fishing from nets, they were fishing on lines, which apparently is the way people still often fish for cod. They would go out fishing each day and bring a boat full of cod back. Right, they would wash the fish. <coughs> then they would be taken to a table to be cut and salted. But one of the reasons why this salt-dried cod was so important at that time was it was a period 
of a great deal of exploration across the world. And if you think of the difficulties of carrying food for sailors, having some sort of protein that is dried and salted and will last for up to 10 years was extremely important for those who were exploring. I want to tell you about the, the fishing in Newfoundland. You see, we haven't had no news. People are wondering when they all get back again. How big was the fish this year? Did they make as much money as last year? Will it be enough to see us through the winter before there's work again next year? Oh, they fish out there as big, you know. Have you seen the size of them? <laughs> Where's the fish? Oh, no, there's not no fish. <laughs> <laughs> no fish. <laughs> <laughs> me. When the men have caught their fish, they deliver them to the stages where the others cut out their innards and cut off their heads, split the carcasses and pass them to others who hang them up or lay them out to dry. It's always rowdy once the fishermen are back from the fishing season. I think most of them are just so relieved to be back home. Then they like to celebrate hard. <laughs> Merchant and naval ships would all often pass through Paul Harbour, dropping off dozens of men at a time when we're looking for beer and women. Records of the Paul Museum show little that explains the women's general role during this period, aside from a few young apprentice records. One of the earliest records I was able to obtain that involved women was in 1737, again slightly out the time period set. Looking at women's marital status on the women's records, I can only conclude that their options of employment was limited with no man to represent them. But it was the tenacity of the women in the community that pulled together, helping each other and enabling them to rebuild. And their story made me realise what this project is all about, community. It was designed as a community project and the history of the Paul Newfoundland cod trade is testimony to the strength of the community here. I salute the courage of the men who went to sea and I salute the fortitude of the women whose stories may never be told. Thank you. I'll just say it's a complete honour and privilege for me to be here today uh, to share this special occasion and obviously to, to commemorate the work that um, Don has done and his team has done and it's definitely got the title right you know if I was if I was back again a long time ago a 13 year old boy 13 year old girl looking at that pirates castaways and Captain Coppish that is going to attract my attention it's so important for for us and our young people um, to realise the history of our, of our great town um, because the work Don's done is going to help me, I'm sure, other people in the town uh, talk about our history so that the pebble of knowledge will be dropped in the pond of history and will spread out. Um, so all I can say is thanks Don for everything you've done for Paul, uh, for, for keeping the history alive and uh, it's going to be celebrated for many generations to come, uh, partly due to the, your hard work and the team's hard work. So can I just say congratulations to everybody, congratulations to the Rotary as a whole for everything you do for Paul. Um, I think I can speak for the people of Paul, the town of Paul, and say thank you for everything. And um, it's just been a great privilege for me to be here today. So thank you, everybody. And a round of applause to you all. Boys and roll down. 